Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, my guest is, is Jeff Hawley, otherwise known as Hashtag Jeff. And Jeff is an SEO expert. What's cool about Jeff is that he works with publishers, bloggers, creators to help them come up with an SEO strategy. And what you will learn in this episode is that it's more of an art form than it is like a, I don't know, a bunch of technology. Um, He really opened my eyes to SEO, as you'll hear in this episode. I think if you're trying to grow your organic traffic from Google, this is the episode for you. So without further ado, here is my interview with Jeff Hawley. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So we met about a year ago at the first Ad Thrive conference. And I have to tell, I told you this in person, which is you blew my mind with what (laughs) you taught about SEO because it finally clicked and it made sense. So I want to go through some of those basic things that you taught me, uh, which I think my audience is going to love because as we just talked about, it's not super technical. It's really very logical. But before Mm -hmm. we launch into that, can you tell me about your kind of background in SEO, how you got into this? Um, yeah, so I got into SEO, not really actually planning to get into SEO. Um, mm-hmm. I got into SEO because I was always inter- interested in owning my own business. Um, I was always very entrepreneurial. And so just, I mean, uh, since I can remember, I was always just wanting to start a business and, and work for myself. Um, and so in order to do that, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do. So I um, actually just started studying digital marketing because I knew that no matter what I did, I'd have to have an online presence because this internet thing mm. was booming. And I figured that no matter what, investing in the internet would be a, a, a valuable asset to me. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I studied digital marketing a lot and um, paid and SEO, which is the organic side and, uh, naturally lean towards organic Mm -hmm. or SEO because I was really big into bootstrapping and, um, really working to get traffic rather than always just having to pay for traffic. Right. And so, um, little did I know that SEO and digital marketing would actually become my business, Mm. but, um, I started, with uh, uh, an MLM out of Idaho actually called Melaleuca. And okay. so they didn't really have like this online presence. So it was really cool because we actually actually got paid to get it more of an education, which was really nice um, because everything that we brought to the table, like I would say 90% of it got turned down. So it was just me getting an education and studying up on different tactics and strategies and whatnot. Okay. Um, and then my mentor, he had a PPC or the, the paid side of search. Um, he had a company that did that. And so he had this big long list of clients that he had picked up over the years um, that he was doing SEO for. Okay. And they like they weren't really an SEO company. And so I ended up purchasing those clients from him and starting my own business. And um, yeah, so I, I did that for a while and went and worked for a bigger agency and then went in-house and then... Um, in the last two years, um, I think it's about two years ago, I started working with bloggers and influencers. Um, and yeah, I've just kind of been here ever since. Well, that's, uh, well, that is great because the thing that I, I feel like you speak the language of bloggers, you get where we're coming from and you definitely help us get more traffic. So if I, if we were to step back given that you work with a bunch of bloggers like food bloggers and you know the whole kind of gamut what would you say some of the biggest mistakes bloggers make when it comes to seo and the main thing could be that they ignore it (laughs) um honestly like i actually whenever i have a client that says that they're really bad at seo because they've never focused on it Mm. a lot of times those are my favorite clients to pick up because that means they haven't screwed up their SEO. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I thought you so, were going to, I thought you were going to say, cause they have low, low hanging fruit. 
I mean, they, they tend, they t typically do, but the nice thing about those types of people is that they have focused purely on audience and content mm. and they haven't um, really fallen into any traps to where they've <clears throat> gone into any like spammy link building or tactics or things that, that maybe were not as authentic or genuine, mm. um, which is very, very commonplace when people start to focus on SEO because um, it's always, it, it, a lot of people teach SEO in, as a way to manipulate or try to um, encourage Google to rank them. Um, but the people that haven't focused on SEO actually do it more naturally. And so if they've reached a certain point in their career where, ha where they have a lot of traffic and they haven't focused on SEO, I really like those clients because th that means they've done probably most, if not all of the, the things right. And now it's just about tightening things up and increasing the traffic from there. I, I, to I totally get what you're saying. And I think that the two things that you drove home for me, and maybe then we can unpack them. The mm -hmm. first one is that Google is really, really smart <laughs> and you can't trick it like you used to be able to trick it. And so therefore the more authentic you are, the better. And then I would say the second thing that you have taught me is that if you have a big library of content, to see it, see that content, not as stuff that's kind of dead sitting in your archives, but mm -hmm. as like books in your library that you can then yes. go and refresh. Absolutely. So could we break those two down? Because honestly, like when I think For of sure. you, these are like, you gave me these two pieces, two tools or two awarenesses and you kind of blew my mind. Like you changed our whole strategy based on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of Google and how, like can you trick Google anymore? Like how did people used to trick it and now what is Google about? Yeah, so my philosophy on SEO, um, I would say is, is quite different than a lot of people in my industry. Um, a lot of people, so to kind of step back, uh, to, to that original question, can I mean, yes, Google is very smart. Can you trick Google? Are there tactics to manipulate and, and stuff? Absolutely, there are. Um, that is one thing I've never focused on, though. Um, there, there are huge forums dedicated to basically people that are looking to uh, trick Google or manipulate the search results. So that that something that is still something that is a thing, and it still works to an extent. Um, that being said, the reason I've never invested in it is because it's, it's always a hustle mm -hmm. because Google always figures it out. Um, so all of that, the, the reason I got into SEO was because, uh, I, I wanted to build up this organic traffic and, and gain momentum. The nice thing about SEO and, and organic traffic is that once you start gaining the momentum, it really starts to work for itself. But if you're gaming the system, um, you're basically just working until you get caught Got and it. then it's about find, figuring out the next tactic, um, to do the same thing. And so you just, you continuously, like there are huge pe like people that gain or have huge gains in that, that space, but it's, it's not my, like, it's not ever something that I've ever gotten into or, or have a desire to mainly because that's not, that's, it goes against the reason I even got into SEO in the first place. Got it. Got it. And these are people like in these forums who are like doing experiments, right? And they're like, yeah. if we do this, what happens to our traffic? If we do yep. that. Okay. And that Google is like one step behind them or, or kind of figuring it out. And then we'll like, oh, that's, you know, we're going to squash that. Exactly. And, and, and I mean, that, I mean, there, I think, I believe that there will always be ways to manipulate, but like, again, that kind of goes against, I mean, this whole industry of, blogging and, and influencers is, um, and, I, and actually my own, like I got into SEO because I was an entrepreneur building a business. Like I'm, I'm a huge brand um, advocate. Like I, I'm really big on building brands and yep. businesses. Yep. And like, if you do that, you can be very, very successful at SEO. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's just, they call it black hat SEO. Right. But yeah, there's huge forums dedicated to it and stuff. And I mean, there's still a lot of people that, are very successful and I mean it's actually in um, something that I study and follow because the not because I participate but because it a lot of times it's 
kind of a, a peek behind the curtain to really see how Google operates. Right. So. right. So in terms of how smart Google is, uh, you really opened my eyes to this in that it used to be if you write a blog post, you want to put the same keywords in all the time. And then mm-hmm. you were the first one to say, no, you don't, because Google <laughs> can understand what that blog post is about. So, yes, you do want keywords, yep. but you want to make it a good experience. So can you speak to that? Because I thought that was really um, it makes a lot of sense. And it's also really eye opening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the last few years, Google has really dedicated themselves to to more, like rather than just a, a one plus one equals two sort of situation, um, what they're trying to do is rather than them input all the rules and have like this, um, this end goal or like this reaction that happens, um, they've invested a lot into like their own AI, um, mm-hmm. artificial intel- intelligence and and really making Google, like trying to make Google the computer um, be more human mm. so that when um, like when we use certain words and phrases, like we understand, even though it may not be the same like word or phrase, like we understand like the meaning and the context behind them. And I mean, if you think about it, Google has all of this data. And so it's actually a lot easier than we think for Google to be able to do this because they see all these patterns of words and, and the way people use them and, and things like, for instance, um, one, one example that I use a lot is, um, if like I search for spicy bean dip and I see a result that's, that that's optimized or that that's, that's going after jalapeno bean dip. Like I naturally know that that's a spicy recipe that I, when I click on it. And so, um, Google, we're starting to see a lot more sites ranking, because they've written really good content, even mm-hmm. though they don't have all of the exact match keywords in them, um, which is why, like you, I mean, we, we've talked about this when at the events and stuff. But um, like, this is why, like, I, I really like Yoast, but Yoast can also be kind of this crutch or this actually um, this ailment, even to where it's 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 hurting people because they're like Yoast is telling them to get in these exact match keywords so many times when in reality, like you don't need to be doing that. You can optimize for the user and actually write your content rather than having to manipulate and, and always be thinking, oh, I need to force these words in there. Right. And, and just for the audience, Yoast is a plugin that will yes. tell you whether you've optimized your post. And I will tell you, I came up to you and I said, do I need Yoast to get to a green light? in order to feel good about this post because my assistant will go crazy if it's not green, you know? She'll be like texting mm-hmm. me at all hours going, I can't get the post green. <laughs> and I said to you, do I need to get it to green? And you said, no, take Yoast as a suggestion, like as a direction, yep. but it's not set in stone and it's mm-hmm. much better to have content that makes sense and that is a good experience for the visitor, for the reader. Exactly. Like you can get green lights in the Yoast SEO plugin and still have really crappy content. Mm. Yeah. So would you talk to me then, what is good content in the eyes of Google? Um, good content is content that's thorough and that offers a good user experience. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very good writers out there Okay. that, um, that if, if, if they're writing for like the Wall Street Journal or some other publication to where it's it's very like people are there to read word for word, mm-hmm. um, they're, like, they're, they're, they're more than qualified for that. Um, but in the space of, of blogging and a lot of the, the industries that, um, that I focus on, food, DIY, lifestyle, like all that stuff, um, you have to make your content very, very easy to consume because mm-hmm. we're, we don't read websites or like, I mean, these types of websites, we, we don't read them like we do a book to where we read word for word. Um, we're in a very scanning, skimming um, uh, era to where we, we read headings and bullets and, and we skim through it and then we may go back and read it more thoroughly. Um, so yeah, so I mean, thorough content, so like, the thing with Google is that when we use Google, we have a question, we have a problem, we have something that we're trying to get resolved. Mm. And so they want to serve results that solve that problem for their users, which is also our users. And so we need to make sure that 
like if we're writing recipe or DIY or whatever it is, like we just we need to not only just answer the question, but we need to be thorough and understand the situation that user's in to make sure that we can kind of take them down those paths and be the full resource right. um, for that. Like if I'm if I'm writing a, a post on on how to change a toilet, like I'm not going to just tell them like the two steps and how to change a toilet. Like I, I know that they're going to eventually get to this step where they need to know what like a wax ring is or whatever it may be. Right. Um, and so then I have to kind of walk them through that step as well. And so I just, I need to understand my audience okay. and be very thorough when I write rather than just address by giving here, here's 10 steps to have like on how to do this. Like right. we need to address what that is more thoroughly. Right. And then would you say you should have a post that says, this is what a wax ring is so that you can supplement the answer to how to change a toilet? It really depends on the context. And um, in that case, like if I'm a DIY blog, right. like I'm probably not going to have a really thorough resource on what a, a wax ring is. Okay. But um, on some other topics, like um, if, if, if there are other things around that wax ring that I need to know, then I might have a post that's a little bit more thorough. And like, for instance, um, let's change gears and let's go to like a recipe. If I have a, like a slow cooker recipe, it might be worthwhile for me to have a guide on how to use my slow cooker because mm. there's a lot of other elements to it. Um, even though in this one post I may be addressing one thing and be more thorough in that one thing, I can then link to my other resource about this slow cooker. Um, and now I am the thorough resource because I'm understanding my audience and, and the different pain points that they might be going through. And Google then is looking at the fact that you have a variety, you know, you have a lot of content. So for example, mm -hmm. we do really well with baby shower posts, yeah. right? So what, because of you and looking at my <laughs> analytics, what I see is, oh, we rank well for girl baby showers. So then what we've done is we've created posts around girl baby shower, girl baby shower decorations, mm -hmm. girl baby shower invitations, girl baby shower food choices, you know, desserts, mm -hmm. whatever it is, because we want to then own girl baby showers in the eyes of Google, you know, mm -hmm. like they are reputable, trust them. Because they yep. seem to know a fair amount about baby showers. Mm -hmm. So it was like only because you had said that to me that I went back, looked at my analytics and thought, oh, let me build off of what's already working. Exactly. And you have to, you have to, I mean, this is where SEO is creative. Like a lot of people approach SEO like this, it's this mathematical equation and it's not always a mathematical equation because there, there may be topics like that to where we do branch out, but there may be other topics where we don't like. And this is where it becomes creative and we have to kind of figure out and like really understand our audience mm -hmm. to figure out if we do create those external pages or if we include it there or like if we just avoid the topic altogether and link to a Wikipedia article because we don't want to be a dictionary. Right. So it, it, it is, I mean, this is where SEO just kind of becomes kind of tricky for some people, but at the same time, like that's why I love it so much is because it requires thinking and, and testing and applying and really thinking about the user. Right. And I would say that that is another takeaway that I got from you, which is there isn't a right answer. People would be raising their hands going, what about this? <laughs> like, I want you to tell me, Jeff, this is the right answer. And you're like, mm -hmm. no, it could be, but it might not be. And you kind of have to go with your gut and you have to kind of explore and experiment and see what works for you. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that was kind of eye opening for everybody because it's like, wait, but, you, you know, isn't this a technical field where there should be a right answer? Mm -hmm. I think I, sometimes I, I'm surprised that people don't get more frustrated with my answers because I, I give a lot of non answers to where people will ask me a question and instead of giving them like the answer, a lot of times I'll give them like context and say, well, I mean, it really depends and like this is why. Right. Um, but I also think that that's why like like I've I've done so well in the space is because like I'm I'm a big fan of like the the old saying like give a man a fish, you feed them for a day, like teach them to fish and um, you feed them for a lifetime. Right. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of teaching people to fish because they're going to be able to fish for their own family much better than me just providing them fish. Right. But it's so frustrating because everybody wants the Jeff seal of approval. <laughs> like, yes, I'm right. doing it right. You know? Yeah. Um, so in terms of posts, are long posts better than short posts? Again, it, this is one of those non-answers. Ah! Um, Again, it really depends. It depends on the topic. Um, one of uh, like 
And the reason I say that is because, uh, the, like an example that uh, we always use in the SEO industry is, if you Google search, is it Christmas, there's a website that just has one word on it and it either says yes or no, depending on if it's Christmas. Okay. Um, and like that is more than enough information for that search query or for like that, like whatever the, the, the inquiry is there. Okay. Um, and so it really depends. I would say that um, in most cases, like longer, like longer content, more, and I would say not longer content, more thorough content mm. is proving to be more successful with SEO mm. than shorter content. Mm -hmm. Um, but that being said, like that, that's not a universal rule. Like, again, it really depends on the topic. Um, it really depends on like what the purpose is. It also depends on how you structure it. Like, um, there's a lot of like really good, really long content mm -hmm. that, sucks for the user because it's just words on a page right. and that's why it's up to us to like if we are going to have long form content we need to use headings and bullets and possibly even have a table of contents and other things that really make that content easy to to digest right and the one thing also that you said is since most people are consuming content on their phones especially if you are mm -hmm. a a food blogger, you know, you take those beautiful mm -hmm. photos and you want to shove all those beautiful photos into your <laughs> right. post. And I was, I was impressed with your answer, which is you said no. On which like, one? On like a food post, you know, where mm -hmm. you want to put every single angle oh, of yeah, that yeah. cake into mm -hmm. the post. <laughs> and, and you were like, no, don't do that. You know? It's, it's taken me a while to step up to the plate on, on that topic just okay. because I, like out of fear of offending people, like, because nobody wants to be told like, Hey, I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like now, like, uh, like I've kind of become a little bit more part of the industry to where people see me as, um, like, like on their side rather than against them. Right. Um, and so, like, I always, I always pose the question, like, yes, it's very pretty, but who are those images for? Are they for you or for the user? Right. And most of the time when we think about it, like, there's a lot of content where we, we have images that's, like, the images are there for us because it's pretty. Right. And in reality, like, what are they there for? They're there to solve their problem. And, yes, it's good to have pretty pictures make, to, like, give that good first impression. But we also have to make sure that those images are helpful and that they're not just um, something that we skim over. Um, and it was interesting. I was at one of these events and, um, ad thrive, uh, the, the ad network, one of the big ad, no ad networks, they actually kind of contributed to the conversation and said that when they see just long images and when they see all images that are just the same, mm. that they are noticing that users just skim really quickly past those images. Mm. And so if you have ads on your site, you you can actually monetize better by diversifying those images using horizontal um, images rather than like 100% vertical images. Right. Um, you can actually monetize better um, when you're when you're applying these things because people linger longer on the content. Right. I mean, yes. And you had said this, and you said you know think about it on a phone that you just don't mm -hmm. want to be seeing image after image of the same thing from a slightly different angle. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow. So, you know, what we've been doing is pulling out a lot of images in our blog yep. posts going like, is this necessary? Yep. Whereas before you're right. It was kind of like, oh, just add more pretty and it will somehow do better. <laughs> so that's what social media is for. Put all your pretty pictures. I like you can do as many pretty pictures on social media as you want. Right. Um, and I'm not saying you can't put pretty pictures on your site. Just be a little bit more intentional about it is all. Are you a blogger or entrepreneur whose traffic is taking a hit due to those ever-changing social media algorithms? Have you heard that the real money's in your email list, but you don't know how to increase your subscribers? Do you feel overwhelmed trying to grow your social media followers and trying to be in all places all the time? If any of that describes you, I want to share a tool that will increase your social media followers, grow your email list, and bring in more traffic to your site. It's called Milo Tree. Milo Tree is an app that my husband David built for our site, Catch My Party. When we began Catch My Party back in 2009, Facebook was sending us loads of traffic and we were growing like crazy. Well, that is until a sudden algorithm change had us scrambling. 
We knew that Pinterest was the best place to get more traffic. And so in 2015, David built a pop-up to grow our Pinterest followers, knowing that more followers equals more traffic. It worked immediately. In the four years that we've been using the Milo Tree app on Catch My Party, our Pinterest account has grown exponentially to over 1.1 million followers. And Pinterest now drives millions of page views to our site every single month. In 2016, we rolled out the Milo Tree app to help other online entrepreneurs just like you. And we expanded it to help you not only grow your Pinterest followers, but also your followers on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. It'll grow your sales on Shopify and Etsy, and it will even grow your email list. Milo Tree is easy to use. It can be installed in under two minutes with zero design or technical skills. And as fellow online entrepreneurs, we understand the importance of site speed and staying in Google's good graces. So Milo Tree is lightning fast and Google friendly. The Milo Tree app is also customizable. You can focus on growing one platform at a time or switch between several. We also provide you with analytics to help you choose which platforms to focus on. Right now, you can get your first 30 days for free. Just go to MiloTree.com to sign up for your free trial today. And don't let anybody tell you that traffic doesn't matter. It matters a lot. Whether you want to work with a premium ad company, go after larger brand sponsorships, or simply have more people to market your own products to, your traffic must be growing. If you aren't converting your visitors into followers, subscribers, and customers, you need to change your strategy. And Milo Tree will get you the results you need, but it can't help you unless you add it to your site. So take the first step today and head over to MiloTree.com and start your free 30-day trial. There are no contracts and you can cancel anytime. As a bonus, once you sign up, I'll send you valuable business tips each week to help you continue to grow your business. You can't be everywhere all the time. Let Milo Tree work for you. It's fast, it's easy, and it gets results. So what are you waiting for? Get your free trial today. Go to MiloTree.com. So the other thing that you blew my mind with was this idea of your content, thinking about your your past posts, not as stuff that's kind of uh, like in the basement somewhere, but that mm-hmm. that content is really valuable to you if mm-hmm. you are willing to go back and update those posts. So could you talk about this? Because this changed our entire strategy. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of updating old content, um, especially when it's still applicable. I mean, the nice thing about most um, people in, in the, the industry, like the lifestyle and food and DIY, is that our content is very... Uh, evergreen right and so like if I wrote this awesome Christmas cookies post 10 years ago like I mean my audience is still interested in it 10 years later and so um, there may be some things depending on your industry like for instance if we go back to the how to change a toilet um, if you're in the DIY space like there may be some updates over the years I mean to make I mean like either new products or whatever to make life easier but at the end of the day like a lot of these, this content is very evergreen, and so it's in our best interest to keep those things updated. Also, I mean, most people like on Pinterest and Facebook, like most of us are already repinning and resharing things as they become seasonal or relevant. Like, why don't we republish it and and breathe life into it? Because one, that tells users, hey, like even if we didn't change like a, a ton on it, like. But it, like, it shows that we're still invested in our content and, and it's still up to date. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we see like that 2015 date, um, whether it be on the post itself or in search results, a lot of times in our mind, we, it, it feels old or outdated. And so we want something that we know has at least been looked at and addressed. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, that old content is if we're updating and republishing and adding value, one, I mean, that, that resurfaces that, that improves that. But it also it makes makes your site. If we look at our sites as a whole, it makes it so that we're not just leaving things back there. Like it, we're 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 moving our site forward as a whole, rather than just creating new content and moving forward that way. Right. So after I saw you, uh, what we did. So we post three times a week, 
Mm-hmm. And we do like a roundup post of new stuff. Mm-hmm. And we do like where we show off our favorite parties of the week that people add to our site. But then now what we do, we used to do two new posts. We mm-hmm. go back into our ar- archives every week. And one of the things that we do is we update an existing post. Mm-hmm. And it has, one, saved us time, by the way, because yes. it's a lot easier to update, make a new collage, or just add mm-hmm. some more information, make it more current. Yep. Um, but it's it's also like given us, I don't know, like a new, fresh perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I have I have clients. It's it's awesome to to see kind of like when when they start to shift their perspective and realize that okay, this isn't about old content or new content. It's about both. It's about like it's about the health of our site and, right. and our users. Right. Um, well, I get I get the question all the time. Like, is it better to update old content or create new content? Like, again, that it, there's a non-answer for that. It's it depends on your audience. Like, and and where your site is. Like, some people it's more beneficial for them to just focus on new content. And other sites, um, it's beneficial for them to focus mostly on old content. Um, right. But I've had clients where they've they've uh, been posting three to five times a week, and they'll like new content. And then what they'll do is they'll they'll pull back a little bit on that and update like two or three posts for every like one new that they were creating. Right. And so now like they they've still got new content going out, but they're improving old content at the same time. And they start to gain a lot of momentum that way because they've been blogging five, six, ten plus years, and they have a lot of content that needs to be updated. And so that, that's how a lot of times um, sites will gain that momentum. Totally. And and by the way, if you go back and do this, know that you will you will cringe. You will totally <laughs> cringe at your old content. So don't be surprised. You might need to even go take new photos of that recipe. So just think of it as how far you've come mm-hmm. <laughs> rather than well, beating yourself up for like, oh my God, how could I have <laughs> taken those awful photos? Also, don't be a perfectionist. Yes. I have a lot of, I mean, it's natural in this space for us all to be perfectionists because we are experts in our own fields. Right. And so we are our own worst, uh, like we judge ourselves more than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things that I try to get across to people is that when they do find that, um, if they have a bunch of old photos, like base it, base that judgment on like the user rather than just you, mm. because a lot of times you don't need to reshoot all of those photos. A lot of those photos are still very good. Right. And so you can always like maybe reshoot one to put at the top to make that good first impression, but the other photos are still good enough. Um, and so, um, I can't remember, I've, I've actually heard, uh, people quote this recently quite a bit, um, they, they said uh, something about uh, perfect versus like just published or something like that. Ooh, uh-huh. um, and it's it's better to publish rather than just to be perfect. If, you, if you're if you looking for perfect, you're never going to get there. I think that's so. so wise, especially in this world. You know, I, I will go back to a post and see like a typo and I want to kill mm-hmm. myself. And then I have to go, no, you know, it is a typo. It's all right. Yep. It's really okay. And I saw it and now I can correct it. Um, <laughs> because otherwise, yes, it's like death by like a thousand cuts. Yep. Otherwise, like going back. Now, do I need to be thinking about, if I'm doing all this SEO stuff for Google, do I need to be thinking about Bing and other search engines or Pinterest? I mean, I know Pinterest is in many ways similar Mm-hmm. Um, so, so if I do all this, will it kind of work in other areas? So this is one of those things to where like if I'm following best practices, mm-hmm. then yes, we need to be focusing on being and all that stuff. I'm really, really bad at it though. Um, okay. and the main reason is, is because, um, yeah, when I'm thinking about maximizing my efforts, like I, I can't do everything yep. and I've found more success by following, like simply focusing on Google um, because one, I mean, they are the majority, but then two, the other search engines typically follow. So Mm. the, yeah, so I'm really bad at that, but if I'm answering the proper way, then yes, we should be, um, like I would say Bing would be like the next one to focus on. Um, Pinterest though, like I really look at that as a a separate entity altogether because, um, when we're, we're, we're talking about focusing on optimizing this content, mm-hmm. um, the content on the site 
um, will affect how we rank in Google and Bing, but it's like on Pinterest, it's a lot different and mm-hmm. I'm not a Pinterest expert, so I can't really speak, but like to all that, but, um, I mean, Pinterest has its own set of strategies to be successful there. Right. And so I would focus on Pinterest over Bing. Um, but I also look at that as more of a social platform than like a search platform, even though it's, um, kind of an in-betweener. Right. Um, right. But yeah, like there's a lot of the, the reason I say Pinterest is because I see a lot of uh, correlation between content that does well on Pinterest right. um, tends to more easily do well on with Google. And sometimes our Pinterest boards show up in Google searches. Yep. So we get kind of that double hit. One thing that I is focusing on SEO. Totally. One thing that I learned at the Ad Thrive conference, which I thought was really interesting, you might be able to speak to this. Traffic from Google is worth more <laughs> than traffic from social networks. Yes, I, I love that. Um, That's I mean, the first time I'd heard that. Yeah, well, I mean, if we think about it, 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 it really makes sense because if we think about um, a, the user experience and we think about when we see something on Facebook or Pinterest, a lot of times we're not really um, we're not really engaged. Like it might be a good idea, but really like we're there to maybe save it for later or ooh and awe over like some photo or, or think that it's a great idea and comment. Right. Um, but when we search for something on Google, like we have a need, like we're engaged, like, like and so we're a very qualified user. Mm. And so engagement goes way, way up when we come from Google rather than when we come from search. So yeah, um, I don't know what the numbers are. Like I know that I've seen various numbers, but yeah, it's it's pretty significant um, when it comes to like monetization and and the the quality of traffic that you get from Google versus others. Right. So your ads are worth more to yep. you if somebody comes to your page via Google versus mm-hmm. Facebook. So I thought that was super interesting. Okay, just as a as a final thing, what would be some quick tips? to find relevant keywords like what you know we've talked like you were the one who introduced me to SEM rush which is a very which is a very expensive mm-hmm. platform but mm-hmm. are there any other down and dirty tools that you would recommend somebody use easily to find relevant keywords to use to guide your posts yeah um, the reason I, I use SEM rush is mostly because it gives me a good like volume Okay. Um, the keyword volume. So I, I know the popularity, so I can really do some more qualified research. That being said, uh, just using Google um, is a great resource for that because if you search for, for, like, if you just get into the mind of your user and just start typing in searches to see what shows up and, and all that, like, you're going to get a lot of inspiration from either the results you, get, you see, but also Google has some features like a people also ask box that shows like questions that people are asking. Um, it also shows related searches. And so you can really start to dig just in that way. Mm-hmm. There are, there's a, uh, an extension that you can add to your br- browser extension. Um, it's called Keywords Everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only other free one that I know of that gives search volume. Mm-hmm. But the problem that I have with it is that it's it's good if you have the keywords in mind. It's not good for keyword ideation to where okay. you're, you're trying to dig up keywords. Right. It's right um, here in my toolbar as we're talking. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that one's really good. And then another free one that I really like is uh, Answer the Public. Ooh, but yes. That one's more specific to find questions. But if we think about how Google's used, I mean, it's it's used for questions and, and things like that. And so it helps us get in the, the mind of our users and, and really dig up the what they're looking for. And one thing that I think I learned from you was to put those questions in your post with Mm -hmm. the answer to actually word for word, write the question, like want more recipes on whatever, or like, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever the question is that somebody is searching for, write that question in your post Yep. with an answer. And and more importantly, like I say, I, since, um, I mean, a lot of these things are, are, are growing and, and these are becoming more popular strategies. Mm. Um, I've realized that I need to clarify that because a lot of people will just go through and they'll list out questions. Mm. And then what happens is that we get into this, like our, where our, this area where our content feels very robotic. Mm. And so we, we just need to make sure that we don't go too far down that path. But you're absolutely right. Like if we call out those questions and, and make it so that those questions are included in our content, 
um, it's very good because, I mean, as a user, like as I see the different problems that I'm coming across, it's a very good user experience um, because I, I, it's easy for me to find the answer to those. Right, right. Like, what is the next question? Oh, there it is with the answer. Exactly. I think that is so terrific. So the thing that I, my biggest takeaway from you is that SEO is not this incredibly technical uh, thing where you have to use all these different tools and you have Mm -hmm. to kind of have that analytical mind that the Mm -hmm. key is really to get into the mindset of the person searching to solve a problem. And if you can solve that problem and you can be the best source, Mm -hmm. you're going to win. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that blew my mind. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Um, uh, I mean, it, with SEO, as with I mean, many other things, there's, there's two aspects. There's, there's usually a, a non-technical and then a technical aspect. And uh, if we focus on that non-technical, it's, I mean, SEO can become really fun. But I'd also like, I mean, I also like to encourage people to not be afraid of the technical side mm. of SEO. Like, I mean, it, it, it's helpful to be analytical in all those things because that tends to help us answer questions and really dig in a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, SEO doesn't have to be technical. Um, the, I mean, it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about being perfect or not, not doing it at all. Like, um, I would say inch in to the non-technical stuff because it'll make the technical stuff easier down the line. I love that. Okay, Jeff, how can people learn about you, join your group? Because uh, that's how I first heard about you, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so how can people reach out to you? Yeah, so on, I'm, I'm really terrible at sales. <laughs> Do it. Go for it. Um, but on my website, you can, I mean, you can, I mean, read up all, all about me. I, mean, we really do, I just have a couple services. We do the course. And that's oh, wait, wait, what's focus. your website? What's your website? It's hashtag Jeff.com. Okay. So it's spelled out. Yes. H-A. <laughs> don't, don't put the, don't put the symbol because that won't work in browsers. Okay. So spell out hashtag Jeff.com. Okay. Yep. And then on there, um, you'll be able to see the, the course. Um, and so there you can, you can sign up for the course. And right now until July, um, we have a, a partnership with AdThrive and, so all AdThrive members um, get in for free. Um, it's not, I mean, that's that's all due to AdThrive. That's, that's uh, AdThrive's doing their paying for all their members to be part of the course right now. Thank you, um, AdThrive. That's, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. That's, and I think that's until July at least right now. Okay. Um, but if you're not part of AdThrive, I mean, you still join the course and, and things like that. Um, we also have audits that we do, and that's where people, we can help with the technical side of, of uh SEO that way you don't have to and then you can just continue focusing on the creative side um, but that also helps give you a path to know the the right direction to go with SEO and make sure that you're on the right path and isn't it true that in your course you have a Facebook group and you'll answer everybody's mm-hmm. questions yeah so every Tuesday we post a Q&A thread and we every like starting on Thursday um, Thursday and Friday we'll answer all the questions that were added to those that were added before like Thursday basically but every week we have those and I mean, it, lately we've had a couple hundred comments every week. It's been crazy. Wow. Wow. Well, Jeff, I have to say, I am, I'm so glad that I met you. I'm going to see you again in October, I think, at Looking the next AdThrive Thrive conference. And you have just, again, opened my eyes in a whole new way. So I'm so happy to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I, it's, it's been fun. I hope you guys liked that episode and that it gave you a lot to think about, a lot to implement. Remember, traffic matters. So SEO matters. Social media matters. Your email list matters. All of that. Um, If you have not yet gone to milotree.com and installed your pop-ups on your site, you're missing out. So go right now, get your first 30 days free, see what we can do for you to help you grow your business. And I will see you back here next week. Mm